Hi, welcome to season two of my podcast, All About Her. I'm your host, Shreya Anand, and I'm a high schooler interested in STEM. Join me as I speak to various women in STEM to learn all about her experiences and advice for girls like me. So back earlier in the year when the Perseverance rover first landed on Mars, of course, it was an incredibly monumental moment for the scientists who were working so hard and were so involved in this whole process, but also, especially for me, and I know many, many others who are watching the entire thing, it was so inspirational. So for me, I made it my mission to find some way to interview a woman who worked on the mission and get their input on what exactly happened behind the scenes and also their advice for other women who are possibly interested in engineering or aerospace engineering more specifically. So today, I'm so happy to announce that I will be interviewing Christina Hernandez, a payload systems engineer on the Mars Perseverance rover and current systems engineer on the Psyche flight system at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I hope you guys really enjoy this interview. We talk about everything from her inspiration for going down this path, how she was honestly kind of bored with engineering at first and its fundamentals, but really learned how to love it. And also about being an astronaut and things that you might encounter there as well. So I really hope you guys enjoy this interview as much as I did making it and let's get on with it. Thank you so much for joining me today, Christina. Would you mind just quickly introducing what you currently work on and what you specialize in? Yes, so uh, my name is Christina Hernandez. My pronouns are she and her, and I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And I, by trade, am an aerospace engineer, but at work, I'm actually a payload systems engineer. And that's really just a fancy title for somebody who gets to be a jack of all trades when it comes to building scientific tools that are robotic explorers like the Perseverance rover or um, Curiosity rover or the Psyche mission, they all send tools to go explore um, our universe. And so I get to work on those and I get to see them from an end-to-end perspective. So all the way from the design to eventually the operations at their uh, respective location. So before we get into all that, though, let's do a couple of what I like to call the fun questions. So I have three questions for you today, um, kind of surrounded around uh, space and that kind of stuff. But there's also one that is a little bit more open ended. So your first question is, what would you do if you met an alien? Um, Well, I would freak out because... (laughs) I mean, my favorite movie of all time is Alien. And so I would love to like go and explore the universe and actually meet this creature. But I'm also a scaredy cat. So I think I would momentarily freak out. But then I would be like, oh my gosh, like this is not a human. Like I think my brain would just not process. But then I would ask them like, like, hey, what's up? Like, tell me about you. Like, where do you come from? I would just be so curious about, you know, where an alien came from. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So next question is, this kind of two questions in one. Have you ever tried astronaut food? And if so, do you think it's better than regular food? Oh, good question. So I have tried astronaut ice cream, like the one that they sell at the science museum. And not really my thing. Um, It just tasted like a really dried up cookie. So I really commend astronauts for sacrificing the the deliciousness of a regular ice cream sandwich uh, for that vacuumed out prepackaged cookie. (laughs) Um, Okay, last question. If you could meet anyone you wanted right now, who would you want to meet? That is a fantastic question. I would love to meet uh, Elena Ochoa. Um, She was the first Latina astronaut um, for NASA. And I would just love to know, you know, about her story and kind of like what we're doing today, like the real story. Like, how did you get there? What was it like the first time that you saw the Earth from space? I can only imagine, you know, how much it meant for her. So I would love to grab a copy with Dr. Ochoa and talk about things. 
All right, perfect. That That's really, you know, I, I think an interesting way to get to know you before we actually get to know you, if you know what I mean. Um, so let's get into the kind of uh, questions about where you kind of came from, um, I guess, and what your background was going into this career. Yeah, so I was born in L.A., um, so my parents came from Mexico, um, and for better opportunity, right, like many of our parents um, have done, and I, you know, was just a really curious kid. I I loved reading. My mom would take me to the library and science museums all the time. I was that know-it-all in school, um, and I just had this natural curiosity um, and I wanted to know why things were the way they were or how they worked and that sort of thing. Um, and so growing up, I was very fortunate that my parents were so supportive of me, you know, going into academics, in this case, you know, science and math. And they would do whatever they could, right, given the um, financial constraints that we had and opportunities that we had uh, to really push me forward. And so it, it really was, you know, a lot of parents ask me, like, you know, what does it take? You know, it, it's, it's, you know, you need motivation, right? Either through your parents or your friends um, to kind of remind you that the world is amazing. And there's so many things to be curious about and really help um, add to that natural uh, curiosity that students have. So uh, you mentioned that, you know, you kind of come from this background that's very, very supportive in um in like all senses. And I think that that's very, very important. But do you think besides your family being so supportive, did you have any mentors along the way, particularly female mentors that would help you in engineering or whatever it is that you were interested in? Absolutely. So even though I came from an extremely supportive environment and I even went to a high school, it was a magnet school where like the equivalent of our football team was like the robotics team. <laughs> um, you know, once I left that environment for quote unquote, the real world, I was automatically different, right? You know, I was either the only woman, I was, I was the only woman with like brown skin or, you know, it, it, it was a varying, um, uh, set of differences. And so when I was placed in an environment where I was the only one, or I felt very, you know, siloed from everybody, that's when, you know, the mentorship really needed to happen. And so I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo um, in California. I went through the aerospace program and, and it wasn't very diverse. Um, you know, a lot of my peers had parents who were aerospace engineers or pilots or, you know, they, you know, they came from that world and I didn't. Um, I only signed up for aerospace engineering because I wanted to take a pretty picture of Saturn at some point <laughs> in my life, right? So it was just completely different experiences. So, you know, that's when I see, sought out the support of um, this one particular professor who ended up, you know, pushing me to go to grad school. And she, um, her name's Dr. Kara Abercrombie, and she really you know, make, showed me that, you know, a woman and a, and somebody who's fun, who loves Star Wars, who loves space, and, and, you know, could be a mom, could do aerospace engineering, get her PhD. She worked for NASA. You know, she she had the dream job from, from where I stood. And so, you know, I just remember her always looking out for me, always uh, pushing me to challenge myself, even when I thought I wasn't capable and um, at the same time, I also joined um, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, which was, you know, a club that focused on, you know, retention of Latino students in college, right, where there are high dropout rates. And so I found also people who, you know, had similar cultures, may have had similar struggles. And I realized, like, I wasn't alone. You know, I had friends, I had family, and that really made the difference. What, what do you think in school were your kind of the, the classes that you like really, really enjoyed and which classes do you think that you, you didn't enjoy as much, I guess? Okay. So if you ask me now, my answer will be different, but I'll, I'll there's one class that's been consistent <laughs> is orbital mechanics. I loved Dr. Abercrombie's orbital mechanics class. And I took, you know, the first one that, you know, undergrads take, and then we took like a mid, uh, like a level two uh, later on in our uh, upper division. But then I also took her graduate um, level 
orbital mechanics and optimization class. And for the first time in my life, I thought it was this beautiful idea that I could determine how things move throughout the universe, right? With, you know, basically math. And at the same time, it was so complex that we needed to use programming to be able to optimize orbits and, you know, be able to calculate them and, and whatnot. And so it was the first time where I realized, like, I didn't need to become an aerospace engineer to do space things. And that was really cool because it opened up the world of possibilities of, you know, I could go be an electrical engineer and, um, work on spacecraft and work on space robots, or I can be a programmer and, and build, you know, artificial intelligence for the satellites that we send to different places in the solar system. And so it was just really cool. And it was very tough and challenging. But when I solved the problem, that sense of satisfaction that you had built those fundamentals, um, it was amazing. I, I, that's one of my favorite classes of all time. And my second, you know, my second class was we got to take a space environments class and lab. Um, Cal Poly really focused on, you know, supplementing the theory with hands on practice. So, you know, we learned about the radiation environment, the micrometeoroid environment, plasma, and then we did experiments in the lab to test those um, environments out as well as the mitigation techniques that we have to do when we go out in space. And so um, that was really cool. But if you ask me now, right, the reason why I say that is because I never found electrical engineering interesting at all. My dad was studying to be an electrical engineer while I was you know, in, in elementary school and he would bring home his stuff and I was just like, oh, dad, like, I don't care about this, this is boring. <laughs> it's not space. And then now that I'm at work and I have to do a lot of electrical engineering, I ha that's how we connect the pieces of our spacecraft and robots. I really wish I would have enjoyed my electrical engineering classes more. Um, so I guess kind of taking a step back again to how did you really find yourself working at JPL? Um, and, you know, what, what steps did you, I guess, take to get there? Yeah, so it was very fascinating because... Um, I still uh, remember that phone call where they called me and offered me a job at JPL. I think I cried for like six hours straight because I couldn't believe it. Um, and then the moment when I finally, you know, got to the laboratory and we were doing our tour for our first day, it was just so surreal. And, and again, this so intimidating, right? Because it's like you are surrounded by some of the smartest people in that field. Um, and they're like, you know, eating lunch next to you at the cafeteria, right? I remember I was geeking out because I would see scientists who helped write some of the textbooks that I used in school, right? And I mean, that's how you can tell I'm a big nerd, right? It's like, I know what they look like. But, you know, one of the things that I learned is that you have to have patience for the process and the journey. And so when I started at JPL, once I got over the fact that I was here, like, like you know, that was like, you know, a couple of months, I was like, wait, but like, what do I want to do now that I'm here? Um, so I actually went in um, as a space environment specialist, right? So my job was to, um, you know, create radiation, micrometeoroid, orbital debris models, uh, for our spacecraft, uh, do a bunch of analysis and make sure that when we send things out uh, to space, that they'll be able to withstand um, the space environment. And, you know, after a few years, I was like, okay, like, this is great. But, you know, what else is there? Like, I'm curious about how we even build these things in the first place. And so I spent a lot of my time being a learner, right? I, I define myself as a lifetime learner, because Oftentimes, uh, we are there's this pressure, this outside pressure to want to like climb as much as you can, right? Like, and that's great, right? We need more women in leadership. We need a lot. We need diversity in leadership in the first place. But I wasn't really in a rush, and that was advice that I had gotten from a lot of my mentors and advocates. It's spend time again understanding your craft, understanding how things come together, because at the end of the day. All of this knowledge is going to help you when you are in a lead position. 
Um, and so my goal was to be like a lead engineer, right, for a payload system or a flight system, or one day even be a lead on a mission. And so I'm really focused now on staying technical, understanding the material that I have in front of me, asking lots of questions and, you know, making space for myself in the room, right? Because sometimes it can be so intimidating to raise your hand or to ask a question in a meeting. And I quickly realized that I had to get over that, right? Now people might say that I asked too many questions, but <laughs> you know, at the same time though, right? It's you're in the room, you have the opportunity to learn. So that's kind of how I found myself. I, you know, I really focused in on what I thought was important. And that was, you know, the craft of, you know, space exploration. And then I really, um, allowed that to grow through outreach, right? Science communication, you know, doing outreach with, you know, students um, and explaining what we do. And, and that kind of also gave me the motivation to want to learn more so I could, you know, showcase more and I can show students that there's, you know, this wonderful world of engineering that will give you opportunities to travel the world, you know, uh, have a decent living, you know, it's, it's a great place to be. So, Let's talk a little bit about perseverance. Um, you, you're leading the the Pixel project, um, and that's absolutely incredible. But would you mind just explaining a little bit on how Pixel works and what exactly its functionality is? Yeah. So to take a step back, um, so my role is a uh, instrument engineer. So generically, it's a payload system. We have a bunch of titles. The point <laughs> is, is like you know, I focus on Pixel. Um, which is actually being led by Abigail Allwood, who is one of the first uh, female uh, principal investigators for a Mars mission, right? So she's really breaking um, some barriers with this amazing instrument. And so my job is to make sure that from an end-to-end -end perspective, Pixel does what Abby needs to do her science on Mars. And so I'm enabling science through the systems engineering of Pixel. And so Pixel is an X-ray spectrometer. And what's really cool is that it, it, it basically emits X-rays and then it, it measures the energy back and characterizes the spectra through histograms, right? So you might remember from like chemistry um, or, or physics, right? You know, different types of elements have different signatures. And that's exactly what Pixel is looking for in our samples um, to find signs of ancient life on Mars. But what's really cool about Pixel, the X-ray spectrometer is really cool, the science is really cool, <laughs> but this thing dances on Mars. So when I say that is, I mean, Pixel sits on top of a hexapod. And so hexapod is just basically gives Pixel, you know, multiple degrees of freedom to be able to scan a sample the size of your fingertip. And at the same time, while it's, you know, moving itself, it has this amazing instrument flight software that is autonomously making decisions of whether or not it should sample a particular area based on the spectra that it comes back. So it's kind of a little AI-ish, right? You know, it's one of the most autonomous instruments that we've sent um, to Mars. And so it's fascinating seeing, you know, all of these pieces coming together and ultimately, you know, being able to take the science that's going to help us understand, you know, Mars's ancient past. Um, so Pixel is the most complicated thing that I ever had to learn, right? Like I, I came in um, having worked on two of the other um, instruments on our uh, seven instrument payload, and those were very challenging, right? You know, I had to understand how the sensors worked. One of them was a radar. I had to understand, you know, the basics of like ground penetrating radar. But Pixel in, in my mind was like one step up in complexity because of the software interactions. And that's actually an area that I'm really interested in learning more is, you know, sending more autonomous science instruments to space, you can get more capability. Um, so yeah, it's it's been fascinating. You know, Pixel's doing well, she's on Mars now. Um, and we're basically, you know, commissioning all of her functionality so that hopefully in like a month or so, Pixel is cleared to do science. And uh, it's really crazy to see an instrument that was like literally just in front of me, you know, a year and a half ago, 
um, to now being on Mars and seeing pictures of her on Mars. <laughs> um, so there's kind of another part to Pixel as far as I can understand, and I believe it's called Sherlock, which is another question of mine, which I'll get to after. But um, so how exactly do the two of them work together? Mm, that's a great. So I'll take a step back and give a quick overview of this of the science instrument. So the way we selected the science instruments for the rover, and it and it's the same process for um, all of our space missions, is that they have to complement each other, right? And and they have to complement each other in the sense of meeting the science objectives of that mission. And so on Perseverance, uh, we will be. Um, characterizing the geology, right? Understanding Mars's geological record to help understand like the planetary evolution and, and why it is the way it is now and how it was before. Understanding um, like the climate of Mars, right? Not just for um, future manned missions, but also um, uh, just, uh, you know, characterizing how the climate could have impacted um, the, the, the geology. So preparing for uh, human missions, um, I said manned missions, and I like to correct myself. Uh, I don't like that phrase. Um, it's so ingrained, though, but we're going to change that. Um, and then we're looking for um, signs of ancient life. Um, and then the fourth goal is collecting samples. So for the first time, we're actually going to be collecting samples with the idea of bringing them back on a future um, sample return mission. And so all of these instruments play a certain part of those goals. And so for looking for signs of ancient life, all of them are going to be contributing in some way. And so Pixel will be characterizing the elements um, with the idea that microbial life in the past could have left specific remnants, um, which are characteristic in certain elements. And so Pixel would be able to apply that layer of context. Sherlock which is on the turret, so the hand, right next to Pixel, right? It's Pixel's neighbor. It's going to be able to characterize with its UV spectrometer um, the organics that could be present, right? So Sherlock is looking at the molecule, so like one layer um, up. And on top of that, right, you know, we have the SuperCam instrument, which is on the the mast or the the head and neck, right? It's the the evil laser eye, as I often call it. And, and that's going to be able also to detect certain um, organics. So layered on top of each other, all of these instruments are going to give us this picture of what Mars was like in its ancient past 3 billion years ago. And that includes even the radar rim facts, which will help us understand what the geologic record is, is happening like at the bottom um, where we can't necessarily dig up and see. Um, and uh, MassCam Z um, will be characterizing in high resolution context imagery, like what's happening. Um, Sherlock and Pixel also have um, cameras. Um, the Sherlock one is really cool. It's called Watson. Uh, so they're best buds. And so Watson's basically like a magnifying uh, glass, right? So it, it'll look really up close and help us understand we have the, the scenery uh, imagery from like Mass Cam Z, but then we also have the really up close context that'll help scientists understand what potential structures could be present. So they're all complementary to each other. Um, last kind of question, like I said, uh, Sherlock, Pixel, Watson, like all these names, where exactly do they come from? Because I really want to know. That is a great question. So the principal investigator, um, as the like the leader of the science investigation, gets dibs, <laughs> and uh, so some of them are just quite clever. Um, so I, I've learned a couple of, of fun facts for some of the instruments. So Meta, uh, which is the Spanish instrument, um, in Spanish you can say me da, which means to give. And so I remember the Spanish PI was like, well, it's because it gives us science, right? And so that's how they came up with with Meta. Rimfax is actually a really cool story. So Rimfax was one of my first instruments that I got to work on. And at the same time, I was reading Neil Gaiman's book on Norse mythology. <laughs> and so it turns out Rimfax is based off like the name Rimfax. I think it's like Rimfaxi. I don't, I, I'm probably screwing up the Norwegian, but it's the midnight horse 
uh, from Norse mythology. So the one that changes day uh, into night. And so I thought that was really cool that within this acronym, of rim facts, you know, they were able also to culturally say, hey, like, you know, this is a Norwegian instrument. And so all of the different instruments have really fun uh, stories like that. <laughs> That's incredible. That was another one of those questions that I just had to ask. Um, but Thank you so much for joining me today, Christina. I learned so much about all that you do and everything that's happening at JPL is absolutely incredible. So thank you for sharing everything with me. No, of course, I, I was super happy to support. And again, right, we just have to remember that, you know, there is space for us in STEM, right? And and even though, you know, we're not quite there yet in the sense of, you know, making it a completely inclusive um, environment, recognize that there are there are people out there allies and advocates that if you reach out to them you know they'll help you on your journey and um uh, it takes a lot of grit and huh, perseverance but you know it it really makes the difference and so we need I'm, i really love your podcast and i'm super excited that you invited me here today I hope you all enjoyed today's interview as much as I did because I learned so much about what it means to be an engineer with NASA and also really just from Christina's advice as a whole, has, it's been so inspirational to me. So definitely be sure to go ahead and check out Christina's LinkedIn, which will be down below as usual. And also make sure to follow my Instagram because I will be creating content every single week during the summer both through Wholesome Wednesday and my regular podcast releases every single week. So be sure to follow for more information about that. And in the meanwhile, stay safe, stay strong, and stay snazzy. Annyeong!